Uh, thanks, Melissa, and thanks to everyone who's uh, joined us on the webinar today. Um, so let's get right into it. Uh, so, so the main point of our talk today is that the scholarly record is evolving and that this has important implications for stewardship of the scholarly record in general, and then also academic libraries' role in stewarding the scholarly record in particular. And just to reinforce this point, I wanted to start by sharing this picture from the recently published uh, New Media Consortium Horizon Report on Academic Libraries, which looks at some of the, um, the key trends, challenges, and technologies that are impacting academic libraries or expected to impact them within the next five years. And the picture is a little hard to digest at a glance, but what it's saying is that the evolving nature of the scholarly record um, is expected to be one of two key trends impacting technology adoption in academic libraries over the next three to five years. So this really suggests that it's worthwhile to spend some time unpacking the nature of this trend uh, and considering uh, its implications for academic libraries as they carry out their traditional mission of you know, gathering, organizing, and curating the scholarly records. So that's what we're going to do in today's uh, webinar. Quick look at the territory we're going to cover. We'll start out with some background on the, um, the trends shaping the scholarly record today. And then we'll get into a more in-depth discussion of the scholarly record and stewardship of the scholarly record, and we'll hang that discussion around two reports that we recently published in OCLC Research. Um, we'll then move on to apply those ideas in the specific context of academic uh, libraries, and we'll reserve some time at the end uh, for questions and discussion. Okay, so let's take a, a closer look at how the scholarly record is evolving and try to map that landscape out a bit. Uh, and to start off, um, let me offer this example as something that I think is emblematic of the evolution of the scholarly record uh, that we're witnessing today. So OU Create uh, is a program run by the Center for Teaching Excellence at the University of Oklahoma, and its purpose is to offer services to faculty and students to build and maintain a digital identity both for themselves and for their scholarship. So on the website it says, Create aims to empower all members of the OU community to craft and control their digital narrative through the use of blogs, portfolios, wikis, and more. And it seems to me that um, OU Create is, a, is an excellent example of how the scholarly record is, is evolving. You see the shift in focus to the digital environment, uh, the adapta adaptation of new channels of scholarly communication, and the notion also that you, know, you have a scholarly identity that extends over a diverse range of um, scholarly outputs. And it seems to me that the three goals that are highlighted on the website there in the upper right corner, I'm sorry, left corner, um, empowering digital scholarship, expanding digital literacy, creating digital citizens, those are becoming fundamental services for supporting research and learning in today's environment. Let's move from the particular to the general and try to summarize some of the key forces that are shaping the scholarly record today. And the first one is no surprise to anyone. You know, we're seeing this massive format shift, um, you know, moving from a traditional print-centric scholarly record to one that's increasingly digital and networked. The boundaries of the scholarly record are blurring too. Um, you know, traditionally, we would think of you know, mainly journal articles, monographs, and so forth as comprising the scholarly record. Those are still important, of course, they're being joined by an array of other materials, uh, data sets, uh, computer models, um, lab notebooks, uh, interactive programs, visualizations, and so forth. I think some of the fundamental uh, characteristics of the scholarly record are changing. Um, if you think about you know, the traditional scholarly record, uh, it was essentially static um, you know, because of the format that it, it manifested itself in. You know, stuff was uh, mainly in print. Once it was published, it didn't really change. Uh, most of what entered the scholarly record uh, did so through formal publication channels. And what was included in the scholarly record was primarily outcome focused. It focused on the results of scholarly inquiry. And it didn't document much of the context that occurred before and after um, uh, the um, production of those results. Today, I think the uh, scholarly record is really turning those characteristics on its head. Uh, the scholarly record is much more dynamic, again, because of the format digital that it's largely um, manifested in. 
It's disseminated through a blend of both formal and informal publication channels. And there's much more focus on documenting the context, the process of scholarly inquiry for a couple of reasons, I think. Uh, in many disciplines, there's a, there's a heightened interest in replicability. Um, and then I think also, I think there's higher expectations today for what I'll call leverageability. You know, the idea that I should be able to take your research and um, blend it seamlessly into my own work, uh, whether it's to corroborate your results or, or build on those results in some new line of inquiry. And then lastly, um, stakeholder roles reconfiguring, and by that we mean that the pathways by which the scholarly record is created and consumed um, are shifting into new forms. So we see traditional stakeholders taking on new stewardship roles um, and some traditional stakeholders dropping out of the picture entirely. So understanding um, the nature, the scope, the evolutionary trends of the scholarly record uh, is an important issue uh, for many organizations, for libraries, for publishers, for funders, and so forth. And with this in mind, um, OCLC Research uh, set out to develop a framework that would help organize and support discussions about the scholarly record. It would provide a big picture view of the scholarly record um, in the sense of defining key categories of material that the scholarly record was stretching to encompass, and also some important stakeholder roles associated with the scholarly record. In producing this framework, we felt it would be useful as a common reference point for discussions about the scholarly record that take place within domains, but then perhaps even more importantly, discussions that take place across uh, different domains. And we felt it would be a useful resource to support strategic planning uh, uh, as well. So the report is um, freely available on the OCLC Research uh, website. I want to spend a little bit of time now going over some of the highlights of this framework where we give you a sense of what we think the scholarly record is evolving into uh, today. So this is a look at how we framed out the scholarly record in terms of the nature and scope of what it might contain. And we can start in the middle of the picture with the blue rectangle, which we've labeled outcomes, published outcomes. These are essentially the, the, the final reporting of results, conclusions, ideas, and so forth from scholarly activities. Uh, and, and these final outcomes are, of course, um, you know, still the coin of the realm for scholarly communication, and that's why we privilege them there at the center of the picture. Uh, a lot of these outcomes take the form of, you know, the familiar text-based materials like journal articles, monographs, and so forth, although increasingly those are supplemented by um, uh, things like video, um, complex graphics, uh, visualizations, and so forth. Now, the rest of the scholarly record is divided into two broad areas, which we call process and aftermath. So let's deal with process first, which is the upper half of the picture. By process, we mean just, you know, the process of scholarly inquiry, the process um, leading up to the production or that produces really those, those final outcomes in the center of the picture. And what we did was we identified three broad categories of materials that are generated during that process phase and that we might potentially capture and make part of the permanent scholarly record. And the first category there is method. So by that we mean materials related to the methodology of scholarly work. Um, things like software, computer models, uh, digital lab notebooks, sampling frames, experimental protocols, uh, instrument calibrations, and so forth. Um, evidence, you know, these are essentially the raw materials that go into uh, uh, a particular scholarly activity, research project. Um, obviously things like data sets, survey results, um, also new or enhanced primary source documents, even things like links to findings from other scholarly works. And then the last category there, um, uh, discussion. This is really the idea that when you, you, know, you think about those final outcomes, middle of the picture, they don't just leap out of the scholar's head fully fledged. They often go through some sort of process of refinement and improvement uh, through interactions and discussions with colleagues, and other scholars, and so forth. And those discussions could generate materials that we might capture as part of the scholarly record. So things like preprints, listserv and blog discussions, conference presentations, even grant proposals and, um, and reviews of grant uh, proposals would be relevant uh, here. So the, 
the main idea is that anchoring the outcomes in the middle of the picture directly to the methods employed, the evidence used, and the formative discussions that take place during the process of scholarly inquiry really helps contextualize um, and deepen our understanding of those, of those outcomes. It helps facilitate replicability, uh, and it helps leverage those results into uh, new research. Now, once the outcomes from uh, a research project have been formally published or otherwise made available, some scholarly activities can con uh, surrounding that piece of work uh, can continue in what we call the aftermath phase, and that's the bottom half of the picture there. And just as we did with the process phase, we identified three broad categories of materials that could be generated um, during this phase that we might want to include as part of the scholarly record. So the first one, we have another discussion category. So this is the idea that once something's published, you know, there's various discussions or interactions around that piece of work that might spring up that generate materials we could collect as part of the scholarly record. And many of those discussions can occur through the same channels that we described for the uh, process phase, but you'd also have things like, you know, post-publication uh, reviews and commentaries and so forth. Revision, uh, you know, uh, this is the idea that once something's been published, it can be revised in various ways. It can be enhanced with additional findings. Errors can be corrected. Clarifications can be made uh, and so forth. And again, this creates materials uh, that might be uh, of interest for the scholarly record. Uh, and then the last category, reuse, um, this is the idea that, you know, again, a published piece of work can be edited or repackaged in various forms uh, for new audiences, for new venues. Um, so think about things like conference presentations, summaries, uh, blog posts, um, versions of scholarly work uh, intended for a popular audience. Um, and there's other examples, other examples we could imagine as well. Now, we're not saying that everything that's represented in this picture will necessarily find its way into the scholarly record for every discipline. Um, I think it's better to say that this is sort of a maximal view of the scope of the scholarly record, um, uh, representing the kinds of materials in which there's you know, a potential interest in making those materials part of the permanent uh, scholarly record. And I also should note that there's a dynamic element to this picture as well. Um, and that's the idea that, you know, certain materials that we might initially categorize in one of these outlying components in the picture might over time actually end up in the blue rectangle in the middle of the picture. And I think that data sets are a great example of that. In some disciplines even today, the publication of an important um, data set is now considered a first-class scientific outcome, you know, on a par with a, you know, a traditional uh, journal article. So over time, things that we might put in the outlying components could migrate to the blue uh, rectangle in the middle. We need to keep that dynamic component uh, in mind. Now, I realize the picture is a bit abstract, so I wanted to make it more concrete by providing some specific examples of materials for each of those components. Um, so starting in the process phase with the method category, uh, Methods X is a journal uh, that was recently launched by Elsevier that allows researchers to publish details about methodological innovations they've come up with. Um, if you go to the website for this journal, they have this great tagline, um, releasing the hidden gems from your lab notebook. Uh, evidence, data, a couple of examples, uh, data repositories and data journals. Uh, Dryad is a repository of data sets associated with published articles in the life sciences. Uh, the Geoscience Data Journal is published by Wiley. It's a platform for formally publishing research data through a peer-reviewed process similar to what you go through uh, for a traditional journal article. And then for discussion, uh, we use archive.org there as an example. Archive is a preprint repository that provides an opportunity for scholars to expose their work to peers prior to um, formal uh, publication. Moving down to the aftermath phase, the bottom of the picture, uh, the discussion category again. Uh, PubPeer is a platform for um, discussing or commenting on published articles. Um, if you go to the PubPeer website, they say that PubPeer started from a perceived lack of um, post venues for post-publication discussion uh, on journal websites. So that's the gap they perceive themselves filling. Uh, another example, Why Nations Fail. 
So this is a blog that was launched um, simultaneously with the publication of a book by the same title. It's, it, it, it was intended as a venue for authors to the authors of the book to launch and sustain a discussion about the ideas they present in the book and apply those ideas to um, current events as opportunity arises to do so. And you see more and more of those kinds of blogs appearing. Um, revision, a um, couple of examples there. Uh, Figshare is a service that allows you to enhance your published work by uploading ancillary materials, making them accessible and citable. Um, Oxford University uh, Press Online Resource Centers, kind of similar, allows you to um, um, put up complementary teaching and learning materials for um, uh, textbooks that are published under the OUP imprint. So for example, there's uh, an economics textbook there. And you can get all of the diagrams in the book uh, in electronic format. You can get a list of errata. You can get a list of supplementary uh, materials recommended by the authors and so forth. Then for reuse, a um, couple of examples for conference presentations, which is a common way of repackaging or repurposing publications for new audiences and new settings. Uh, so SlideShare slide is a web-based service, which I, I think most of you are familiar with. F1000 Posters is similar. It's a permanent repository uh, for conference posters and presentations. Both of these services then provide a means to make uh, presentations discoverable, citable, and consistently um, accessible. And then I wanted to show you one last example, which I think is particularly interesting because of the ambition uh, of its scope. Um, so this is the Research Ideas and Outcomes Journal, or RIO, and it publishes all the outputs that are created during the research cycle, anything from project proposals, to data sets, to methods, to the final articles themselves. So pretty much covers everything we represented in our scholarly record, a picture that we looked at it a few minutes ago. It's published by a Bulgarian um, academic publisher called Pensoft. Uh, it's open access. It has a peer review process of sorts. Um, and it says that it covers all areas of academic research. So as you see, as I, you know, I said earlier, its scope is pretty ambitious. It's gotten some press in some prestigious places. Um, as you see on the slide, there were write-ups about it in both uh, science and nature. I think it remains to be seen whether a journal of this kind is, is actually viable. Um, but regardless, um, I think it, it, it's, an, it's, it's nicely suggestive of the, the broader patterns that are shaping the scholarly record today. If you go to the website, it says that Rio, um, quote, harnesses the full value of investment in the academic system by registering, reviewing, publishing, permanently archiving a wider variety of research outputs than are traditionally made public. And it seems to me that that really sums up the nature of the scholarly record, you know, the direction in which the scholarly record is evolving uh, today. Okay, so that's an overview of our framework that, you know, the, the part that covers the potential scope of the scholarly record. Let's move on now and talk about stewardship strategies for an evolving scholarly record. Um, so we just recently published a new report, uh, Stewardship of the Evolving Scholarly Record, which extends the ideas in the first report, when we just looked at, uh, to the question of how do you steward uh, a scholarly record that looks like the one you know, we just discussed. Uh, the basic idea then is that stewardship models for the scholarly record are evolving in parallel with the evolution of the scholarly record itself. So in the report, we introduced the concept of conscious coordination, which we think is gonna be the driving principle in organizing future stewardship arrangements for the scholarly record. Uh, so the report explains what we mean by conscious coordination. It contrasts it with traditional approaches to stewardship. And it talks about some of the practical implications of building consciously coordinated stewardship activities. So let's start by thinking a little bit about traditional models for stewardship, uh, which in our view were largely a byproduct of a sort of uncoordinated highly distributed and to some degree duplicative process of managing local print collections. So the idea then is that stewardship of the overall scholarly record wasn't achieved by anyone really intentionally setting out to do that, but it was done by the aggregation of a lot of internally directed local stewardship efforts. 
So what you ended up with then was an aggregate library resource that really was a relatively complete record of the published, you know, print scholarly outputs available, which at that time, you know, I think was pretty much what we viewed as the scholarly record. So in our report, we used the uh, metaphor of the invisible hand to describe uh, this approach to stewardship. Um, so if you remember back to your Economics 101, Adam Smith said that um, under certain conditions, private individuals acting in their own interests are led as if by an invisible hand to a socially beneficial outcome. And we see a similar process at work with these traditional stewardship models. Individual institutions, in the course of pursuing their own internally directed stewardship efforts aimed at preserving their local collections are led or were led as if by an invisible hand to a socially beneficial outcome, which in this case is the long-term stewardship of the overall scholarly record. Now we argue in the report that this approach to stewardship uh, is really inadequate for gathering and curating today's scholarly record. And that's because the evolution of the scholarly record uh, is part of a fundamental transformation of academic library collections. And we can see this by looking at this picture that our colleague Lorcan Dempsey has been using uh, in, some, in some of his talks. Um, so we can start on the left with what Lorcan calls the owned collection. And by this we mean you know, a very, very traditional view of the library collection where you know, essentially libraries go out, they purchase print materials, they bring them back, they put them on the shelves, and they're used, um, accessed and used within the libraries. Uh, physical space. Now, of course, over the years, um, library collections have been gradually changing in complexion and we've been moving away from that um, endpoint. Um, so we've seen things like the emergence of the borrowed, the borrowed collection, you know, the emergence of complex um, resource sharing networks. We've seen um, the emergence of licensed e-content, um, you know, becoming a very important part of the academic library collection. Well, recently we've seen um, shared print strategies uh, uh, come into play where managing print materials in, is being moved from a local activity uh, above the institution into some kind of shared stewardship infrastructure. And now we see the emergence of a scholarly record that's increasingly digital and networked and where we see an array of diverse and technically complex scholarly outputs poised to enter you know, the scholarly record. Um, and these scholarly outputs are characterized um, by a highly distributed pattern of custodial responsibility. In other words, they're scattered all over the network. And many of them, and I would hazard to say most of them, are not in academic library collections. So an important corollary, corollary to that is that the scholarly record is now imperfectly approximated in academic library collections or even in you know, the aggregate library resource itself, because libraries simply aren't collecting and they don't have the resources to collect the full range of scholarly outputs that now comprise the evolving scholarly record. So what we're moving toward is the end point on the right, uh, which is what Lorcan calls the facilitated collection, where providing local access to the scholarly record is less about accumulating large you know, representative um, local collections and more about facilitating access to scholarly resources that are distributed across the network across a wide variety of custodial uh, hands. Now, in thinking about this transition from the owned collection to the facilitated collection, we argue in the report that you're going to see a parallel shift in stewardship strategies as well. So, a shift from the invisible hand strategy, which is really more suited more toward the left hand side of that co continuum, and a shift toward conscious coordination, um, which we think is much more suited to um, the, the right hand side of the continuum, the facilitated collection. So what is conscious co coordination? In the report, we say that consciously coordinated stewardship of the scholarly record is characterized by four principles. The first one there, system-wide awareness. This is the idea that local decisions about stewardship are taken with a broader awareness of the system-wide stewardship context. Who's collecting what? What commitments have been made elsewhere in terms of stewarding various portions of the scholarly record? And how does the local collection fit into the broader uh, system-wide stewardship effort? 
Um, we'll also see the emergence of explicit stewardship commitments around portions of the local collection. So collecting institutions will acknowledge and undertake to fulfill explicit responsibilities in regard to collecting, curating, and making available certain types of materials. And the key idea here is that fulfillment of these responsibilities will be seen not just as a commitment to local faculty and students, but also a commitment to a broader external stakeholder community. We expect to see the emergence of formal divisions of labor uh, within cooperative arrangements. So by that we mean rather than attempting to collect some of everything, greater emphasis is going to be placed on specialization in collection uh, building. Collecting institutions will seek to collect more of less, if you will, and investing more intensively in a narrower range of materials within the context of cooperative arrangements in which different institutions specialize in collecting different portions of the scholarly record. And then lastly, reciprocal access. If you have a stewardship strategy that's characterized by a greater degree of specialization in collecting build, collection building, you have to accompany it by a more robust resource sharing uh, arrangement that ensures relatively easy access to all parts of the scholarly record. So there has to be some mutual assurance that materials collected by one institution are going to be easily available to other institutions and vice versa. So we discuss all of this in more detail in the report. But the basic idea is that we expect stewardship models of the evolving scholarly record um, to exhibit these characteristics in one form or another. So again, to make this uh, more concrete, let me finish up by providing just a few examples for each of these elements of conscious coordination. So for system-wide awareness, think of Hadi Trust. Hadi Trust takes great pains to measure the overlap between its member uh, library's local print collections and the digital surrogates that are in the uh, Hadi shared digital repository. Similarly, Sustainable Collection Services, which was recently acquired by OCLC, this allows comparison of local print holdings to um, print holdings in the library system as a whole, at least as they're represented in WorldCat. Both of these services place the local collection in a broader system-wide context. Explicit commitments, think about the MARC 583 field, which allows you to register local preservation commitments in group catalogs to help coordinate cooperative collection management activities. Uh, and um, also, uh, the UK Research Reserve, which some of you may have heard of, others not perhaps, it's a centralized registry of retained print holdings in the UK, which institutions can use to inform local print retention uh, decisions based on the commitments that are articulated uh, in that registry. Division of labor, um, we see this in, I, I think, in the emergence of more and more specialized or thematic collecting activities. Um, uh, not that special collections weren't always a part of you know, the research library landscape, but I think we're seeing that move to a greater order of magnitude and volume of activity. So for example, think about the Columbia University Library's Contemporary Composers Web Archive, a very nice example of a very specialized collecting activity that isn't duplicated elsewhere. Think about Dryad, which we talked about earlier. Uh, Dryad specializes in curating data sets from journal articles in the life sciences. That's all they do. That's the niche of the scholarly record that they focus on. And then reciprocal access. Um, I think we see this with efforts to reduce frictions in traditional ILL networks. So look at some of the activities in the Borrow Direct network, for example. Um, but I also think you see it in new initiatives like SHARE uh, that, that you know, seek to improve the discoverability, the accessibility of you know, digital scholarly outputs that are scattered all over the network. So I think these examples show that elements of conscious coordination are starting to spread into stewardship activities um, uh, pertaining to both traditional and emerging forms of scholarly outputs. And we think that we'll continue to see more of this going forward. OK, so for the remainder of the presentation, uh, we want to focus on some of the implications of what we've just discussed um, for the particular context of academic libraries. And to take us through that discussion, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, uh, Constance uh, Malpas. So over to you, Constance. Thanks very much, Brian. So Brian has uh, now laid out some of the major themes from our two recent reports on the evolving scholarly record. Uh, while we certainly don't have time uh, in today's brief presentation 
to do a comprehensive review of implications of these changes for academic libraries, I think we can easily identify a few key issues of importance. First, as Brian suggested, it's widely appreciated that academic library collections fall far short of approximating the scope and depth of current scholarly work. As Brian indicated, it's not simply the case that individual library collections are less and less comprehensive, but also that they collectively are less able to represent the richness of new scholarly work products. This is clearly a concern for the organization of library stewardship. A second, traditional stakeholder roles are being reconfigured in ways that are creating new challenges and opportunities for libraries. There are new agents involved in collecting the scholarly record and equally new opportunities for libraries to be engaged in creating and fixing scholarly work in the published record. Libraries are increasingly involved in content creation as well as curation. So there are new pressures on managing stewardship activities more efficiently. Another very important change in this space is the impact of web scale discovery, which is transforming the very notion of what a collection is. As libraries have become more reliant on licensed electronic collections and users have moved their discovery and use of scholarly resources to the web, the notion of what is in the collection has been fundamentally altered. The library is in the get it business through just-in-time acquisitions, article level fulfillment, consortial ebook packages, shared print partnerships, and the like. And this means that discovery and stewardship are decoupled in ways that are deeply challenging to traditional conceptions of collection management. As the breadth and scope of the scholarly record continue to grow, new approaches to stewardship will be needed. Above campus and multi-institutional partnerships will become more important and they will require more conscious coordination. As a consequence of all this, local collection management activities will be more deeply embedded in cooperative partnerships. The context of the collective collection will become even more important to local decision making. To ensure that we have time for discussion in today's session, I'm going to speak briefly about just three of these five key issues. The operational implications of managing more of less, that is increasingly selective curation of scholarly resources. Moving from a collection model that is based on local ownership to one based on facilitated access. And implementing institutional strategies that acknowledge deeper reliance on cooperative and in some cases commercial partnerships. For each of these, I'll offer a few illustrative examples and suggest a few questions for further thought. We may get some of those questions in the discussion today, or you might uh, use them as topics for conversation at your own institution. The illustrations we use here are intended to spur further thought and uh, conversation. They are certainly not the final word. I don't think there's any substantial disagreement about the fact that academic libraries manage only a small part of the evolving scholarly record. One reason for this is that the new modalities of digital research and scholarship are embedded in an ecosystem that is largely outside of the traditional library supply chain. Students and faculty rely on social discovery and publishing platforms that the acquisitions department may not even be aware of. They produce and consume scholarship in environments that have little or no connection with the library, places like Figshare or ResearchGate or Zenodo. Some of these platforms offer services to libraries, others do not. In considering the implications of this changed environment where, as Lorcan likes to say, workflow is the new content, it's useful to think about whether your institution feels a responsibility to preserve or document the process and aftermath of scholarly work alongside traditional outcomes. If it does, it's worth asking what special expertise the library can contribute to selection and appraisal and how this work fits alongside more traditional collection management of purchased and licensed resources. In the networked environment, research and learning increasingly happens out loud, and new publishing platforms are capitalizing on the social dimension of scholarly work. This makes for a much richer picture of how scholarship is carried out, but it also raises important questions about how much of this work is likely to survive. Many of you will already be familiar with GitHub, the online code, code repository. It's used by many computer scientists and engineers, and equally by many students of computer science who uh, routinely use a university subdirectory to manage code produced for course projects. But it's also used for other imaginative purposes. For example, this Rutgers undergraduate has used it to create a personal archive of class notes for math, computer science, and even philosophy. 
We've referenced Figshare several times in today's presentation because it's an interesting example of a researcher and publisher facing repository for new kinds of scholarly work products, especially visualizations, graphics, and fig figures, as its name suggests. Like GitHub, Figshare is used by students and scholars and even by some librarians as a place to publish a wide range of outputs, including conference posters, as in this example uh, from a liaison librarian at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Finally, I want to point to the growing importance of publication venues like ResearchGate that encourage authors to contribute open access versions of their content to a shared repository, which therefore takes on a very interesting role as a kind of parallel library infrastructure. Mendeley is, of course, similar in some respects. Both of these places function as shop windows of content, organized by author or, as in this example, by institution. I'd venture to guess that very few of your institutions has an institutional repository environment that is as appealing and feature-rich as ResearchGate. These new platforms can be viewed as competitors for the attention and engagement of library users, or more productively and positively, I think, as stakeholders with some mutual interest in supporting new forms of scholarly communication. Let's move on to another key issue the transition from owned to facilitated collections. Here we can consider a range of changes that are disrupting traditional library-based stewardship models. A variety of just-in-time fulfillment arrangements are in use in many academic libraries today, and they're complicating the way we think about institutional responsibility to the scholarly record. Does your library feel a responsibility to preservation of content in the selection pool of demand-driven acquisitions, or only the content that is ultimately purchased? What about article-level fulfillment services? Does the library have a role to play in preserving the journal as well as the article, if the article is the only unit the library acquires for fulfillment? Open access resources are increasingly represented in local library discovery environments. They are pointed to, but not managed in the traditional sense. Does the decision to include them in the OPAC carry with it an institutional preservation responsibility? With respect to institutional repositories, we're in an interesting phase of historical development, with a growing number of major universities transitioning away from a model of aggregating content locally, relying on faculty deposit agreements, for example, toward a model that is closer to an institutional bibliography that aims to be comprehensive with respect to the published output of faculty and researchers by aggregating metadata and sometimes pointing toward external content managed by publishers. What is the library's preservation responsibility for content managed outside of the library, but still vitally important to both institutional identity and reputation? Again, we've identified a couple of questions here you may want to consider in discussion. Do you feel sufficiently informed about how researchers at your institution are interacting with external repositories? Do you encourage them to engage with those external platforms? Does the library have any intra-institutional partnerships with other campus units that have a stake in tracking research outputs or understanding how they are used? Very briefly, to touch on a couple of uh, illustrative examples uh, specifically related to the integration of open access resources, uh, a reminder that uh, many libraries, in fact hundreds of libraries, have set holdings in WorldCat on books in the Hathi Trust Digital Library, often without being formal partners in the trust. This is allowed, and even to an extent encouraged by Hathi Trust, which considers its public domain archive as a contribution to the common good. But it nevertheless means that libraries are blurring the boundaries between the collections they make discoverable and the content they are prepared to preserve. Of course, many libraries also include open access journals in their collections, whether or not the university is contributing toward article processing charges for faculty members contributing to those journals. That's not surprising, and it's certainly not a bad thing. A 2010 study found that many of these open access journal titles have hundreds of holdings in WorldCat. But not all are participating in locks or other digital preservation arrangements to preserve this content. As I noted earlier, discoverability and stewardship are increasingly decoupled. 
Brian pointed to the example of Rio as an innovative uh, new open access publication uh, and questioned whether or not we're likely to see that uh, kind of effort sustained over the long haul. I, I do think it's, it's quite clear that some OA publishers have uh, assumed a major role in scientific and scholarly communications. PLOS, the Public Library of Science, uh, is very highly regarded, for, for example, uh, and so too is the journal eLife, which got a lot of attention, some of you might have seen last week. Uh, their publication of a groundbreaking article on the fossil remains of Homo naledi. There's absolutely no question that journals like these that are publishing first-rate, high-impact scientific work are a high priority for preservation. But that preservation won't be assured by the 125 or so academic libraries that claim to hold eLife. It's guaranteed by PubMed Central, a publicly funded repository managed by the NIH through the National Library of Medicine. I don't at all mean to suggest that there's anything wrong with this arrangement, but it is important to appreciate the degree to which academic libraries are dependent on an increasingly complex network of publisher and funder relationships to ensure both the discoverability and the preservation of the scholarly record. eLife itself is perfectly open about the fact that it relies on partnerships uh, with organizations like GitHub, Mendeley, and PubMed Central to make its content, I quote, widely and permanently available. Libraries aren't on that list. As the eLife example suggests, we are all increasingly dependent on networks of collective responsibility to ensure preservation of the scholarly record. As a consequence, there is growing attention to the governance and sustainability of cooperative partnerships, the business model supporting Hathi Trust, for example, or the service level agreements behind partnerships like the Western Regional Storage Trust, a major shared print effort. This is a positive development because it suggests that libraries are developing more business-like relationships with these organizations. With greater reliance come increased expectations of service uptime and reliability. An interesting consequence of this is that organizations like Hathi Trust or the Eastern Academic Scholars Trust, another a major regional shared print effort, are moving beyond simply including trust in their name to thinking seriously about differentiating between the various motivations to participate in cooperative stewardship, acknowledging, for example, that the costs and benefits of content contributors are different from those of capital contributors. These initiatives are developing novel business models that capitalize on the full range of motivations to participate in cooperative stewardship. Here again, we've identified a couple of questions you might consider in your own institutional setting. What motivates your library to participate in cooperative stewardship to the extent that it's already engaged in that work? How formal are those partnerships? What do you expect to gain? What do you expect to give? As evidenced in the growing importance of shared, uh, as evidence of the growing importance of shared stewardship, one can look to the proliferation of newly created positions focused, for example, on managing shared print programs on a consortial scale, for example, at OhioLink, articulating an institutional strategy that explicitly acknowledges the growing importance of shared collections, in this example from Indiana University in developing a program for shared print archiving within the context of a shared digital archive with the Hathi Trust shared print effort, or in establishing a regional digital preservation network, including management of established LOCKS nodes and implementing a new cloud-based digital preservation service at COPAL, a major consortium serving academic libraries in Western Canada. All of this reinforces our argument that conscious coordination will be a defining characteristic of emerging stewardship models for the evolving scholarly record. In closing, I want to recapitulate a few key ideas from our work on the evolving scholarly record anchored in a few important visual references. We define the scholarly record as a selection of content documenting the process, outcome, and aftermath of scholarly work. While libraries have traditionally focused on formally published outputs in their collections, they are increasingly interested in capturing a richer and more complete picture of scholarly inquiry. The scholarly record is supported by stable configurations of key stakeholder roles that ensure that scholarly materials are systematically gathered, organized, curated, identified, and made persistently available. We say stable configurations, but not static configurations, because we believe that library, publisher, and funder roles will continue to be renegotiated in this space. Finally, we believe that sustainable preservation of the scholarly record will require the development of stewardship models that exhibit the key characteristics of conscious coordination. These three components then, scope, stakeholders, and stewardship, represent our very broad 
vision of the future of the scholarly record. We've seen in today's presentation this uh, vision has important implications for academic libraries as they recalibrate the infrastructure, coordination capacity, and shared practices needed to sustain the scholarly record in its fullest expression. Uh, with that, we'll close the formal uh, presentation and, and thank you for your attention. We'd like now to uh, to open the floor to, to questions and uh, and discussion. So uh, I think we'll do a review of the chat and see if there are questions that have emerged there. No questions were submitted yet, but please feel free to submit them now for question, for Constance and Brian to address. Um, if you haven't pulled down your chat window, it's the conversation bubble icon. Just click on that, type your question in the content window, and change your drop-down menu in the Send To field to All Participants, and then hit Send. Don't be shy. Oh, uh, we, we do have a question. Um, uh, do you see a role for, for catalogers in this expanding area of stewardship? Um, well, I mean, uh, I, won't, I won't speak about catalogers specifically, but I, I'll, more generally I would say that um, uh, when you look at this scholarly record that's becoming so much more diverse in terms of the na nature of the materials that it's including, it's becoming so much more scattered across the network because you know it's not just stuff in academic library collections, but it's stuff um, uh, in a variety of custodial hands. Um, and Constance talked about a few of those um, in her part of the presentation. Um, bringing that together into a cohesive scholarly record that can be um, that can support discovery, access, and use, in in my view, is going to depend on a very robust um, data layer that sits on top of those, of, of those materials and that discovery, access, and fulfillment services can, uh, can operate on. Um, so you need to know, for example, you know, someone's published a, a journal article uh, which resides uh, in some publisher's database. The research data that's associated with that journal article is sitting in Dryad. The software that was used in the project is in GitHub. Um, the authors of the paper have a, a blog, which they're um, sustaining a discussion about the, uh, their results with colleagues, and so on and so forth. How do you pull all that, uh, that together um, into a, you know, a cohesive scholarly work? It's not all going to, you, you can't do it physically. It's not all going to sit in the same place. You have to do it using data, metadata, uh, that establishes the relationships between those um, uh, components of that particular piece of work. So creating that metadata uh, and making it um, uh, available and useful to um, services that operate on it, I think is going to be a critical issue going forward. Um, Constance, did you want to add anything to that? Well, I think um, I, I'd segue away from, from that question to, to another that, that's emerged here um, that has to do with the uh, organizational structures for, for collection uh, development and, and management. And I, I do think that both for resource description, cataloging activities, and collection management activities, uh, we do see some reconfiguration happening there. Uh, so, as, as Brian suggested, uh, that rich data layer, the metadata layer, is going to be enormously important in, in reconstituting uh, the scholarly work as a whole when it's parceled out across this uh, networked environment, and much of that metadata work is likely to be taken up um, uh, in, in the library environment. Where it is actually situated, I think, is going to change. I think we see some evidence that it's changing in, um, well, to take a kind of obvious example, the, the Too Cool initiative between Columbia and Cornell uh, took as one of the, their action items the uh, conversation around um, 
uh, sharing expertise in resource description in, in cataloging uh, some area studies collections. And that's an acknowledgment. That's both an expression of that shift toward increasing specialization and also an acknowledgment that in a world where libraries are going to have increasingly specialized collections, the economics will require that you begin to reposition expertise as a shared asset, so shared cataloging expertise shared by institutions that are uh, collectively curating, let's say, uh, uh, you know, South Asian resources. Um, and I, I think it's very clear that we see that trend in the collection management space. Uh, so so uh, our, our, uh, our colleague here, uh, uh, Elizabeth Kirk, I think, believe it is, um, asked about uh, if there are examples beyond the ones we cited. I think there are many, many uh, such examples. Uh, one that comes to mind is is the very interesting work at um, within the Orbis Cascade Alliance in the Pacific Northwest, uh, where there's an active conversation about uh, a collaborative workforce. So, so the question of how do you how do you share staffing? across and within a consortium to support new forms of work, including management of shared print collections. So I think there's a, a very clear uh, pattern of, of resituating traditional business functions of the library, resource description, uh, acquisition, cat uh, curatorial functions, to a group space. And that's largely to support, I think, the need for this increased specialization and a recognition that individual institutions will not be able to sustain um, investment in in building all that ex, uh, expertise at on a on a solo basis on an institution scale, uh, so I think that's one of the really interesting patterns that we're seeing emerge here. Um, I, I see a question from Matthew: Are there lessons from the archives and records areas that libraries can learn from when it comes to managing electronic content? I want to jump all over that question because it gives me an opportunity to highlight some work that our colleague Jackie Dooley has been doing, looking at that very question. Um, she just uh, published a report called The Archival Advantage, Integrating Archival Expertise into Management of Born Digital Library Materials. And she talks quite extensively about how archival expertise is not only useful, but necessary in managing the kinds of materials um, that libraries are increasingly, increasingly being asked to collect and curate. So she talks about um, you know, areas of archival expertise like, you know, um, uh, knowledge about you know, negotiating the landscape of ownership of materials, donor relations, intellectual property issues, um, appraisal selection issues, context, the, the understanding the context of creation and use, restrictions on access and use, how to establish authenticity, and, and, and there's others as well. So um, I, I highly recommend that everyone get a copy of that report. It's freely available on the OCLC research website. As a matter of fact, I think um, uh, Melissa might have um, yeah, it was the URL off there. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's easily accessible. So um, um, all, uh, anything you want to know about uh, the question Matthew posed, um, that, you know, that's a, a good report to start with. So Lisa has posed a very interesting question about uh, article level metrics and, and uh, where those uh, fit into our, our framework of the, of the scholarly record. And I think it's a very good question. Um, we didn't touch on this explicitly in this presentation, but in other contexts we have pointed to the importance um, in this new uh, environment of digital scholarship of, of platforms, many of these new publication and sharing platforms, uh, one of the services they provide to, to scholars that interact with them is the provision of DOIs. And that's, that's very important because it enables citation and tracking of new forms of scholarly work. And that's part of part of the pitch, if you will, of some of these platforms is saying, we'll provide a place where you can publish and share this content in a way that uh, that can fit into alt metrics. Those things will be counted. They'll be part of your uh, contrail of, of uh, scholarly activity. And um, and I think they're, they're an enormously important part of, of this, this whole environment as, as scholars become more and more keenly aware of the importance of making a mark in the network, uh, that ability to actually plug into 
uh, metadata structures and uh, identifier schemes that, that fully valorize the kind of work that's done in the network environment are, uh, are increasingly important. So I think that's, that's really fundamental to some of the changes we're seeing here. Yeah, and I think Lisa has followed up with a comment. She says, I see the DOIing of the scholarly components of um, method evidence discussion, revision, and so on will be Absolutely. a way to consciously, yeah, yeah consciously, yeah. yeah, so. Uh, I, I, yeah, it's a, a very interesting observation, and, and it's something that, that Brian and I have, have discussed occasionally, the importance of stitching together those, that emerging network of DOIs into something that, that provides that richer uh, picture. And I think there's a lot of very interesting work going on at Crossref um, to think about relationships between DOIs. Some of you will have seen they're launching a pilot uh, for an event tracker for DOIs. Uh, so there's a lot more attention to, to how those identifiers can be can be leveraged to to support uh, discovery and a richer understanding of how these different components are being produced and reused. Well, the, 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 the chat window has gone uh, silent, and I see we're almost at time here um, anyway. So uh, uh, I think that uh, that wraps it up. So uh, Melissa might have some information about uh, uh, recordings and um, uh, follow-on materials. Yes, the, thank uh, you, Brian uh, and Constance, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we will post the webinar recording and these slides as well as all of the um, links that were posted in the chat today on our website. The URL is oc.lc slash ESR webinar. We've posted it there in the chat. And we'll also notify you by email as soon as those are available within the next couple of days. So thank you all again for joining us, and this concludes today's webinar. <laughs>